Hi everyone, welcome to Chalk Talk Med, where I cover high yield medicine topics for students. In this video, I'm going to be talking about gallstones, and specifically, you need to know two things about gallstones. Number one, the different types based on what the stone is made up of, and number two, the risk factors for each type, and this is what we're going to cover in this video. All right, so let's start with an overview of bile. So bile is a greenish yellow colored bodily fluid. And just like urine is the fluid of the urinary system and blood is the fluid of the circulatory system, you can think of bile as the fluid of the hepatobiliary system. And that helps you remember that it's synthesized in the liver, so hepato, and it's transported in the biliary tract or the bile ducts, so biliary. Along the way, it's stored in the gallbladder and its final destination is to go into the small intestines so that it can perform uh, the functions that it's supposed to do. And these are its three main functions. So number one, it's important for helping us absorb dietary lipids from our GI tract. Number two, it has antimicrobial properties that help protect the gut. And number three, uh, it allows us to get rid of the body's excess cholesterol as well as bilirubin so that they don't build up and become toxic in our body. And now let's quickly talk about bile content. So bile is made up of three major uh, components. Uh, first one are the bile acids. And these bile acids are important for function one and two right here. So for helping absorb dietary lipids and for the antimicrobial properties of bile. And then the other two are bilirubin and cholesterol. And both of these are inside of bile for function number three. So they're inside of bile so that they can be eliminated from the body. And then in addition to that, bile is also composed of water electrolytes that help it uh, solubilize the material inside of it. All right, and now let's talk about the gallbladder. So gallbladder is a really important organ. It sits uh, in the inferior surface of the liver right here, nestled in right underneath in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. It has two important functions related to bile. It's storage of bile as well as concentration of bile. And what happens is that once we eat, uh, there's a release of a hormone called cholecystokinin. This is gonna cause the gallbladder to contract and release the bile, eventually making its way into the small intestines where it can emulsify the dietary lipids that we just ingested and allow them to be absorbed. The major clinical consequence related to the gallbladder are gallstones, and for gallstones, the main problem with them is not necessarily just having gallstones, but the problem is that they can lodge and cause obstruction of uh, bile flow proximal, and this is how they lead to issues, and this is covered in a separate video called gallstone complications, so if you want to learn more about that, check out this video. But in today's video, the other important thing to learn about gallstones is the different types of gallstones and the risk factors for each, and that's what we're going to cover in the rest of this video. So what the heck are gallstones? They're actually solid precipitates or crystals that form within the liquid, which is bile, and therefore they look like stones, and so they should technically be called bile stones. The reason we call them gallstones is number one, gall in medicine actually refers to bile, and number two, most of these storms, uh, stones are formed in bile inside of the gallbladder, so therefore we call these gallstones. Now let's talk about their causes. You can divide the causes of gallstones broadly into two categories. The first category is what I call the bad squeeze problem. That means there's a problem with gallbladder contraction, therefore it can't squeeze the bile with enough force, and this is going to lead to bile stasis, and when bile sits around, it's going to form sludge and stones. Number two is what I call the bad juice problem. So here, the gallbladder contraction is just fine. There's no problem there. The problem is with the juice, which is the bile content itself. And therefore, if the bile content has too much cholesterol or too much bilirubin, so looking over here, remember bilirubin and cholesterol are the two waste products inside the bile. If it's too high in those contents, then it's going to form their respective stones. On the other hand, if the amount of bile acids or lecithin are too low, so if you have a deficiency of these, then you're also at an increased risk of developing gallstones. The reason is because bile stones and lecithin are both important lipids. Um, that play a major role in solubilizing cholesterol. So if you don't have enough of them in bile, cholesterol will not solubilize, it'll precipitate out and form stones. There are two major types of gallstones. This is really gonna be the focus of the rest of the video. We have cholesterol gallstones and pigment gallstones. And for the rest of the video, we're gonna go through their pathophysiology and main risk factors. So let's start with a big picture look at gallstones and the two types that I just mentioned. We're gonna start with the more common one, which are the cholesterol gallstones. So of course here, these gallstones are made up of cholesterol. Therefore, that means that the bile contains too much cholesterol, which is going to precipitate and form these stones right here. So this bile has a high cholesterol content. On the other hand, we have the pigment gallstones, and these gallstones are made up of mostly bilirubin. And it's kind of easy to remember that because we all know as bilirubin as being a pigmented molecule. So it helps us remember that the bilirubin content is what causes the pigment gallstones. So here, the bile contains too much bilirubin, uh, specifically the unconjugated bilirubin, which is going to precipitate and lead to the formation of these stones. And in contrast to the other one, these guys are going to have a low cholesterol content in their stones. 
for completion, I'm going to mention that most gallstones are actually a mix, so you have cholesterol but mixed with other salts. And because these gallstones uh, have very similar risk factors to the cholesterol stones, because that's their main composition, we're just going to bucket these under cholesterol. So um, easy way to remember, we can just divide gallstones into two categories, the cholesterol stones made up of cholesterol and the pigment stones made up of bilirubin. So now let's start talking about the cholesterol stones and the risk factors. All right, so let's start with cholesterol gallstones. These are by far the most common type that you're going to see in clinical practice. Now, the problem with these is really straightforward. The bile content is either too much cholesterol or not enough things that solubilize it, which are bile acids and lecithins. So whenever this ratio happens, then that means that you have excess cholesterol in the bile. So it's going to become super saturated and it's going to form uh, essentially sludge and stones. And these are going to have a white or yellow color to them, as you can see right here. So they don't have a dark color. Therefore, these are the non-pigment stones in contrast to the ones that we're going to talk about next. Now, even as far back as when I was a medical student, we, which was a long time ago, uh, we remember these risk factors as the Fs, and it's just a helpful way to remember all of these many, many different risk factors. So 40 here stands for age, so these usually uh, start to appear when you get older than 40. Um, family history, because there's a genetic component to developing these gallstones. Fibrates, so these are uh, drugs used to um, treat hypertriglyceridemia. One of their side effects is that they inhibit the rate-limiting enzyme in bile acid synthesis, so therefore um, they can lead to less bile acids, which can obviously then cause cholesterol gallstones. Fasting or TPN, so TPN is total parenteral nutrition, so getting your nutrition through an IV through the, uh, rather than the intestinal tract. The problem with fasting and TPN is that if you're not using the intestinal tract to eat, then you're not releasing CCK, and therefore the gallbladder is not squeezing. So you have the bad squeeze problem that we talked about previously, and this is going to lead to formation of bowel stasis and stones. So fats and cholesterol, this is obvious. Anything like that in the diet can lead to increased formation of cholesterol stones and accumulation inside of bile. And then the final ones are female and fertile. So here, fertile refers to multiple pregnancy history. And so I'm going to take a minute and explain these two right now. So these two are very, very high yield, especially for exam questions. And there's a couple of things that you need to know. Number one, you need to know that the reason for um, female sex and multiple pregnancies or history of pregnancies uh, being risk factors is the presence of female sex hormones. So female sex hormones actually increase the risk of developing cholesterol gallstones. So that's the first thing that you need to know. The second thing that you need to know is that these two sex hormones, which are estrogen and progesterone, do this in two different distinct mechanisms, and you need to know the mechanism for each and how they're different from each other. So what estrogen does is it actually increases cholesterol synthesis in the liver because it upregulates the activity of HMG-CoA reductase, which is the rate-limiting enzyme in cholesterol synthesis in the liver. And that's very different than what progesterone does. So progesterone is actually a natural smooth muscle relaxant. So it's going to relax the smooth muscle in the wall of the gallbladder. So it's going to lead to the gallbladder hypomotility and that weak squeeze problem. And this is going to cause bile stasis and lead to the formation of cholesterol gallstones. So completely different mechanism of estrogen. And this is the final important thing that you need to know about them. All right, so now let's get back to our risk factors here. Uh, unfortunately, there's also a couple of other risk factors that don't start with the letter F, but you still need to know them. And the three most high yield and important ones, at least for exam purposes, I've included here. So number one is Crohn's disease. So remember that this is an inflammatory bowel disease um, that causes damage particularly uh, to the small intestines. And the problem here is that you have less bile acid absorption because of damage to the terminal ileum. So again, this is gonna lead to less bile acids and formation of cholesterol gallstones. Number two here, rapid weight loss or uh, gastric bypass surgery. So this is a little counterintuitive, but essentially this can lead to alteration of bile content, which is going to favor formation of stones. And the final one here, this one makes sense, spinal cord injury. So if you have damage to the spinal cord, you're going to have denervation of the gallbladder, which is once again going to lead to the weak scoose problem, leading to bile stasis and formation of cholesterol gallstones. All right, so now let's return to our flow chart here, and we already finished up with the cholesterol gallstones, so now all we have left is the pigment gallstones, which as we talked about, the problem in the last one was too much cholesterol, so the problem here is too much bilirubin inside of bile. And what happens here is that under normal circumstances, uh, inside of bile, most of the bilirubin is conjugated, and only a tiny little amount is unconjugated. But what happens in the setting of these bilirubin pigment gallstones is that for one reason or another, you have too much unconjugated bilirubin inside of bile, and this um, is going to then become a problem because unconjugated bilirubin is not water soluble. It can't swim. So it's going to try and look for some floaties to hang on to, which is essentially it's going to precipitate out by forming salts, for example, with calcium and other content. And when it does that, it's going to precipitate and it's going to lead to formation of the sludge and stones. So the bottom line is that the underlying problem with these pigment stones is that you end up with too much unconjugated bilirubin inside a bowel. Now, it would be really great 
if that's all there was to it, if that was the end of the story, we could just finish the video right here and I can tell you what the gallbladder's favorite music band is. But unfortunately, that's not the case. We have to go one more step because as it turns out, there are actually two different colors or flavors of pigment stones. There are the brown pigment stones that are brown in color and the black pigment stones that are black in color. And both of these stones um, form because of too much unconjugated bilirubin, but the difference is that the underlying mechanism that leads to too much bilirubin is different between them. So the black pigment stones are primarily due to hemolysis and the brown pigment stones are primarily due to biliary tract infection. And this difference in mechanism is what actually accounts for the difference in their pigment and the difference in the composition of these stones. So what we need to do now is go ahead and go through each of these two stones um, and we're gonna start with the black pigment stones first. All right, so pigment gallstones are a lot less common than the cholesterol gallstones, but among the two types, the black pigment stones are a lot more common than the brown ones. So let's talk about them. So as we mentioned, the bile content here is uh, high bilirubin. That's the problem, and that this bilirubin is going to deconjugate, and therefore the bile is going to become super saturated with unconjugated bilirubin. And as you can see, it doesn't like that. It's unhappy because it's... Um, it is not water uh, soluble, so it's going to form salts primarily with calcium. So you have the formation of these calcium bilirubin salts. And as you know, when you form salts with calcium, those tend to form crystals and precipitate out. And that's how we have the formation of our stones right here. And these stones are going to have this jet black color because these calcium bilirubin salts are going to undergo a series of these oxidations. And as they undergo this process, the pigment is going to turn into a dark black color. And that's why you have the formation of these black pigment gallstones. Okay, so that was straightforward enough. Now let's talk about risk factors. The problem here is what causes high bilirubin levels in bile, and the number one risk factor for these stones is chronic hemolysis. So here I want you to think about your hemolytic diseases, for example, hereditary spherocytosis, sickle cell disease, or thalassemia major. Remember the problem in these diseases is you have excess hemolysis, that means excess breakdown of red blood cells. And that is the only place in the body where you generate bilirubin. So if you're uh, breaking down 10 times more red blood cells than normal, that means you're generating 10 times more bilirubin than normal. So that's going to lead to the high bilirubin content. That's going to then set off this pathway and lead to the formation of these black uh, pigment stones. And in fact, this chronic hemolysis is really the number one risk factor that you should watch out for for these uh, black pigment stones. There are two other causes that are important. Um, one is ileal disease. So again, Crohn's disease, as we talked about before, or surgical resection of the ileum. Both of these not only can cause cholesterol gallstones, as we talked about before, but they can also lead to the formation of these bilirubin black pigment stones. And then the final disease is cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is end-stage liver disease. And as you know, if you have a damaged liver, then you're going to have trouble conjugating bilirubin. So of course, that makes sense why you would have formation of bilirubin pigment stones. All right, so let's move on to our final gallstones, which are the brown pigment gallstones. And these are the least common of all the different gallstones, but you know we still have to learn about them. So this one's actually pretty easy because there's only one risk factor, one problem that leads to these, and that is infection of the biliary tract, either by bacteria or by some parasites that we're going to talk about in a minute. So the problem here is infection in the biliary tract, and this pathogen is going to lead to increased activity of an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase in the bile ducts. And the function of this enzyme is to deconjugate bilirubin, so essentially to take conjugated bilirubin, convert it to unconjugated bilirubin. And now we have the same problem as we've talked about. Now we have excess unconjugated bilirubin inside of the bile, inside of the biliary tract. And again, we're unhappy because this unconjugated bilirubin is not water-soluble. So once again, it's going to form salts with things like calcium. But the difference is that now these salts are going to mix with other content that have been generated by hydrolysis from this bacteria or this pathogen. And therefore, instead of getting the black pigment stones, now this mixture of these salts with this other content is going to lead to the formation of brown pigment stones, which you can see right here. All right, so that was straightforward enough. The causes of biliary tract infection leads to high actions of this enzyme, leads to deconjugation of bile, and then this salt formation mixes with the other content from this problem and leads to formation of brown pigment stones. Now, there are two more things that you need to know about this condition. Number one, you may have noticed that the stones here are in the common bile duct. I didn't place them in the gallbladder like I did before, and that's because that's an important fact here. So the stones that are formed in this condition with the brown pigment stones are, are usually formed in the bile ducts, not in the gallbladder. And that's because the problem is occurring in the bile ducts, not in the gallbladder. So the problem here is a biliary tract infection. So the deconjugation of bilirubin and the formation of all of these stones is going to happen where the problem is occurring, which is in the biliary tract, not in the gallbladder. This is different than what we saw before. So in black pigment stones, usually the stones form in the gallbladder. In the cholesterol stones, they usually form in the gallbladder, but the brown pigment stones usually in the bile ducts, not the gallbladder. 
Okay, and the second and final thing to know about this condition is that it is associated with a parasitic worm known as Clonorchis sinensis, which is also known as a liver fluke. So a liver fluke essentially describes a parasite that likes to infect the liver and the biliary tract, and that's exactly what this parasitic worm does. And uh, once this gets inside of the body, actually, it likes to survey around and check out all the different neighborhoods in the body, and it decides, you know what, I like the biliary tract, I like this neighborhood, you know, they have a good school system. So this worm ends up setting up shop and residing in the biliary tract, and here it can cause obstruction and infection, and it's going to lead to these problems of biliary tract infection and formation of brown pigment stones that we talked about. Now, this is typically um, ingested by eating raw, undercooked freshwater fish, and is commonly found in East Asia. And in fact, in that part of the world, it's one of the leading causes of brown pigment stones. And the final important thing to know about this liver fluke is that um, not only does it cause brown pigment stones, but due to its permanent residency in the biliary tract and the chronic inflammation and problems that it causes, it actually increases the risk for developing bile duct cancer, which is known as cholangiocarcinoma. And in case you were wondering, in the United States, the leading cause of brown pigment stones is bacterial infection secondary to surgery and procedures involving uh, the biliary tract and the bile ducts. All right, so now we've covered all the different gallstones and the different types and risk factors. So this is summary slide number one. We talked about a lot of different mechanisms here for how these gallstones form. So I've uh, kind of combined all of the important ones or the major ones into this one slide so you can uh, have them all in one place. So you can feel free to just uh, pause the video here and review this uh, just to make sure that you're good with these important mechanisms for formation of gallstones. All right, and finally, we have a summary table that will help you keep everything organized. So you can feel free to pause the video here and review this. I do want to just mention one thing and talk about where the stones are formed. I've mentioned earlier a couple of times that most of the stones are formed in the gallbladder. So let me just explain why that is. So remember the function of the gallbladder is to store and to concentrate bile. So what that means is that all the bile inside of the gallbladder is just going to be sitting there for storage. So it's going to be static, it's not going to be moving around. So this gives the bile content like bilirubin and cholesterol a good opportunity to precipitate out and form sludge, and which will eventually form into stones. Furthermore, the second function was to concentrate the bile in the gallbladder, and concentrate just means removing all of the water, so dehydrating it. And so again, you have a liquid environment and you're removing all of this water, so that's going to further increase the chance of uh, bile content precipitating out, forming sludge and forming stones. And for this reason, this is why most uh, gallstones are formed in the gallbladder, with the main exception, of course, being the brown pigment stones, which are formed in the bile ducts where the biliary tract infection is occurring. All right, so now the moment that you've all been waiting for since we started this video on gallstones, what is the gallbladder's favorite music group? It's the Rolling Stones. All right, <laughs> so if you enjoyed this video and want to learn more about this topic, check out these related videos that I've linked here. But for now, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.